<laughs> yeah, well, you know, the thing about the thing about Ozzy is that uh, there's there's been so many interviews over the years that um, it, it's difficult to find yeah, anything well. to say. Um, they weren't very long sessions. This is the thing. Uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm just start things off right here. Yes, we're just, we just went know. live. We just went live just to have a good intro. You know, Alan, this is this is probably I, I, the, the the soundtrack to our childhood right here. Yeah, the right man here. who's responsible for the soundtrack from our childhood. Yeah, our well, adolescence, uh, adolescence, I should say. We won't we won't uh, date ourselves. Well, at yeah. least I at least I uh, press record. That's the good thing. <laughs> oh yeah, there have been many times when I forgot to press record. Like right now. Hold on, let me hit. Well, that's, yeah. Well, that's the important thing. Is just you know make sure you press record. Yeah. And yeah. funnily enough, right before we did the, um, right before we started Blizzard of Oz, I was doing um, a bunch of demos with Bad Company, mm -hmm. and. Uh, they had come from, uh, I don't know if you remember, 10CC, of, of, course, of course. And they had yep. a studio, Strawberry Studios, which was not very far away. And um, they were over there. And uh, I guess the, uh, the engineer let, allowed the tape to run out when they were in the middle of a take. Oh, my God. So, of course, uh, uh, of course Paul got extremely angry. And uh, he's a, kind of an angry guy. And he got extremely angry. And they had to get out of there. And they said, oh, we're coming over to you. <laughs> so I was like, oh shit. All right. Simple so, as that. So, so Max, let's just start right from the beginning, okay? Like, okay. we'll talk about the Aussie era and the albums that you've done and sort of the experience and all, but just tell us a little bit about you for the people out there who don't know. You know, how did you get engine into engineering and how did you sort of move into that production. role of production? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, uh, a brief story. Um... I was, uh, I play guitar, so I was in a, a bunch of bands and uh, it was very difficult to get, you know, going with a band and it was expensive to have the equipment and all that kind of stuff. So um, I answered an advert in the New Musical Express for a sound guy, uh, for a, a German, uh, uh, a German band called Wind. Mm -hmm. And I actually, I went out to Germany and worked with them for three or four months. And um, then I came back to England and I worked, uh, I was basically worked on the road for about seven years. So I did, uh, I was a spotlight operator for Manfred Mann's Earth Band. Uh, I was a keyboard roadie for uh, Baker Gerbitz Army, which was the Gerbitz Brothers and Ginger Baker. Uh, I was uh, a rigger for, uh, and, and after a while uh, I joined, uh, I was a, a the front of house guy for a, a cabaret band for a couple of years. They did all the clubs in England and they were quite a big band called Sparrow. They were on TV about seven times and they won uh, uh, New Faces, I think it was called over there. It was one of those uh, talent shows. Anyway, um, so I did all of that and then I got approached. I was working with Manfred and Mouse, the, uh, the, the, the uh, head of the crew for Manfred Man said, oh, you know, you're too good to be doing this. You need to be, you know, doing uh, other stuff. So he he called uh, he called somebody over at Electro Sound at that time, which was a, a, a British sound company, quite a big one of the big British sound companies. And uh, he said, "Oh, you got to go talk to this guy Mick Whelan." And so I went over there, and Mick, uh, I understood what he was talking about, and he understood that I had, uh, you know, some ears at least, and I could hear what was going on. So. He kind of took me under my wing and he mentored me. And uh, after about six weeks with them, I came to the US in 76 uh, to do uh, the Robin Trower and Jethro Toe Cobill big tour. It's a huge tour. Mm -hmm. uh, we had 90 foot cranes dropping railroad cars over the side of the, uh, it, it, into the arenas. It was a massive tour. The second show I did in America was Shea Stadium. Uh, 62,000 people. I'm like, I'm like, this is, you know, I mean, I was thrust into the big time quite quickly, but only after doing a lot of, you know, stuff in, in Europe. And I did five Uriah Heap tours uh, with all those old guys, even when uh, the original guys were alive. And wow. um, you got uh, quite the resume, it, I guess that's what it comes down yeah, to. I did, yeah, I did Todd Rundgren, Utopia. I did Little Feet with Tower of Power, Horn Section. Um, 
I did a lot of, a lot of these different bands live you know live stuff so I was a crew chief on most of those things I did at the Ava world tour and uh, stuff like that and then uh, I, I got fed up with loading trucks and, and getting hurt uh, so I decided I, I really need to, to be in the studio and I started to talk to uh, uh, Frank Andrews who owned Ridge, Ridge Farm and his brother uh, he, Frank was actually a lighting guy and mm -hmm. he at, at electrosound and uh, he uh, he said well we you know I've got a studio at my place and uh, his brother was the, the guy that uh, designed turbo sound mm -hmm. and so anyway there was all, a whole bunch of stuff we were all hanging around we all we all knew each other and everything and I said well I'll come down there and Frank had a guy in the studio at Ridge Farm that had his own equipment and he was basically taking half the money and Frank was, couldn't he said it's not this is not economical for me so he wanted to buy a, a, a console and he wanted to buy a, a you know a, a 24 track and put his own stuff in there and Basically, I went down there to talk to him, and he hired me to to install all that stuff, and that's how the Ridge Farm thing happened. So that was after about seven years on the road. And so, and, and, and for those people who don't know Ridge Farm, it's uh, what what town is it in again? I forgot. Well, it's in it's in a place called Ricelip. It's in Surrey. It's about it's probably about thirty miles from um, uh, the airport there, uh, uh, Gatwick okay. Airport. Oh, and, Gatwick. Okay. Uh, it's near Dorking, in Surrey. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, so I went down there and I didn't really know what I was doing, but we, we bought the second SSL 4000 series in, in England. The first one went to the manor, which was, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Richard Branson. Place, uh, Richard Branson's place at the Good, time. Good, Alan. I like People that. Rising up. And um, so we got the second one and uh, we put that in and that was very auspicious. And uh, uh, that 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 decision was really uh, probably more Frank Andrews' decision than mine. But I looked it all up and I said, "Damn, this is a great console, you know." So we put that in there, and that was the rise of the SSL consoles. That was when they first came out, and they just basically took over an enormous amount. Up until then, it'd been a lot of Neve consoles and older consoles like that. And of course, you you see all the Neve story in the Sound City, uh, uh, right movie which i haven't seen and they never asked me to be in and i made a bunch of stuff at sound city i made um what what the hell was that uh oh uh loudness you know uh oh thunder yeah in the east. thunder in the east i made at sound city uh, uh dangerous toys i made at sound city i uh, made a bunch of albums there and they never asked me about it okay so whatever so but but Another so, black eye for heavy metal yeah i know right well, what you wanted to focus on the other <laughs> So, uh, so Ridge Farm and um, I wired everything up. It took me about three months to do all the wiring, and uh, we put everything in there. And uh, uh, so, obviously, we're trying to make it uh, as successful as possible. And as I was saying before we got on the air, I was saying um, that we we actually had Bad Company in there to do some demos, and um, that was kind of very fraught with the. You know, anxiety, of course, because it's a new studio. Um, and then um, right after that, uh, we had a, a bunch of different people in there. Um, Judy Zook, I don't know if you remember her from a British artist. Uh, quite a lot of people in there. Uh, Matumbi, which was uh, a, a, a black uh, kind of... Before rap happened, there was uh, toasting, what they called toasting. Is that what they it called actually, it? Which is actually rap, okay. but but it's uh it was like toasting someone. You know, you'd go da 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 da. It's like the talking over the thing, and I think that's actually where rap came from. Although I've never heard anybody mention that, but um, now it has but, been. Yeah, I mean, it was a, they were a big reggae band, and uh, uh, Dennis, what's his name, was uh, producing, and they were they were absolutely nuts because they would work twenty four hours. They'd have like ten guys there. For twelve or fourteen hours, then they have another ten guys come in. I think, so I, think I, just, I just I just lost Alan, but it, go on, go on. Oh, okay. we'll jump back. So anyway, uh, so I got I got really pounded in the studio, and I learned to you know more stuff. But I was but I was already kind of um, understood how to do it all, and understood how to work with uh, um, uh, uh, 
if, inflated egos, if you like, or, you know, people that are used to working with stuff. So you get to use, you know, on the road, you get to understand how people work and you, you get to make sure you don't, you know, antagonize people and you, and you, and you play to them and you make sure they're happy. And so that was a good training for me the seven or eight years before I went into Ridge Farm. So, so I really understood it. So it, was, it was, wasn't that hard. It was really just a technical uh, change from doing one in, one, one in and the stereo out to one in to the multi-track and then back to stereo out. So it was just an extra kind of stage in there. All right. So, so you were the in-house engineer. And I guess at some point, I guess Chris Tangeridis, right, was sort yeah, of like identified yeah, that, as the producer of Blizzard and Ozzy comes, right? I mean, okay, so... Yeah, was... um, I, I, yeah you know, um, the story's been told a lot, and uh, I like Chris. Uh, I liked Chris. And, yeah, uh, we, we interviewed uh, Chris, and he was, he was, you know, twice. And, and what a he great was guy. A great guy, yeah, great I legacy. Nice guy. And, and nothing to knock him at all, you know, at all. Yeah, yeah, no, very nice guy, and... um I was thinking about this because I knew that this was going to come up, and um, one of the one of the mistakes that Chris made was uh, underneath the control room. This is a, this is an old 16th century barn, and <laughs> it wasn't very high. It had you know big uh, uh, gables like this, and uh, underneath the control room, basically it was a uh, stone room or a concrete room, but it was only seven feet high. And Chris made the mistake of putting the drums in there. And I tried to explain to him that, that, you know, this, this room is too small. So it's just, you know, it's going to like, just everything's just going to go. And that's exactly what happened. And I tried to explain to Chris, but he was, he wanted to do his own thing. So I, I left it alone, but I felt, I felt that it sounded really quite bad. And so uh, I, I would say, I would say to Chris, uh, yeah, dude, you should go down on the studio floor and talk to the guys, you know, man to man and all that stuff. So he, uh, yeah, good idea, you know. So he went down there and I closed the door and then I'd like turn off all the headphones and I'd rebalance it and try and make it sound as good as possible. And then the band would come up to the control room and listen. And so we did this for about four or five days. And then I was just like, uh, He's not getting it, you know, because normally I would I would set up a balance and I wouldn't move stuff around that much. I would uh, try to improve on the balance and tweak it. Uh, but Chris was from a different school. He would pull down all the faders, zero everything, and then just build it from scratch real quick. And to me, that's like, okay, look, you you learn what to do, and now you just threw all that away, and now you're trying to recreate it again, and that's not the way I would work. And, and, you know, people can do that. And it's just a different way of working. But after about five days, I said, look, you know, I'm, I said to myself, look, I'm not going to do this anymore because he's not getting it. You know, he's not, he, he's not seeing the, the way forward the with it. Really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so uh, eventually uh, I stopped rebalancing it. And the band would come in, and then they all kind of looked at each other, and there was like some raised eyebrows. <laughs> and so they, yeah, so eventually they said, "Look, Chris, you know this isn't working out." Blah blah blah. And then Ozzy called me. He was sitting up in uh, Tony Andrews, the Frank Andrews' brother had a house uh, just a bit north of the studio, right up there we could walk to. So um, uh, Ozzy called me on the intercom, and he said, "Oh, you know, come up here. I want to talk to you." So I went up there, and he goes. Dude, you know, typical old, you know, <laughs> dude, what the fuck? You know, it's all, you know, and I'm like, well, you know, he, he goes, dude, that guy's fucking gone. Can you do it? <laughs> so I That's go, I yeah, sure, Oz. He goes, all right, you're doing it. And that was it, you know, so that I go, all right. <laughs> typical, so and, very, and, and you know what? And Chris, Chris, again, has created masterpieces as well we're not knocking care chris here no no oh absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, 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 just... and you know I'm, I'm a huge fan of chris tangeridis as well you know and and you know painkiller and and the list sure. just, 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 yeah, yeah sure oh i mean uh and he's done you know and, and but, but it's an honor to be my... it's a it's an honor to be fired by ozzy because everybody gets fired by us <laughs> well i did get fired of course. there you go I've everybody been fired by ozzy a few times. 
you know, and sued a few times too. But um, uh, yeah, you know, so it's a bit of a shame. But you know, these things happen, and um, you know, uh, you move on. You know, everybody gets fired at some point. You know, everybody yeah. moves on, and you get used to it, and you say, "Hey, you know, you do the best you can." And if it's if it's if people aren't seeing eye to eye, then it, you know it, it gets moved on. So uh, I felt kind of bad at the time, and you know, but um, uh, it 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 wasn't clicking with Chris basically. And sometimes it doesn't click, and then if it doesn't click, you're better off. You know, everybody's better off to just part company. So uh, it's, that's it's, basically what happened there. So actually, we ended up with about three weeks left to do the record. Yeah, that's what um, I'm so, seeing. <laughs> yeah. I got it right here, and it literally says <laughs> March 22nd to April 19th. You were joking when you said it was done quickly. Uh, 22nd to the 19th. Yeah, actually, in the first year. The, the, Alan, first, you're coming in loud. You're coming week, in loud. Maybe we lost the first week because okay. we didn't use anything. So uh, as soon as Chris left, I pulled all the drums out of there. We put them in the main in the main body of the uh, uh, of the studio, which was uh, somewhat drier, had a lot more wood and more absorption, and was uh, just uh, sounded a lot better, more natural. But but, but, but Lee Lee Kerslake wasn't in the band yet, right? They they started off rehearsing with I oh i don't know what happened with the rehearsals but as soon as everybody was at rich farm lee was there okay lee was there yeah 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 so okay. uh, and i know i know lee for many for years yeah. i did yeah. of with him he was in your yeah. eye heap so yeah. so he comes walking in like oh lee what the fuck you know and he's like hey what's going on so, and, um one familiar face and so we set them up we we set him up in the middle in the middle of the room and um uh, basically, everybody was uh, around them, and Randy's stuff went down into the stone room to fire up the, up the stone steps, and that, that's how we did a lot of Randy's stuff was done, uh, firing out of that room up the stone steps, and that made that made a lot more sense sonically to work like that. So, Max, did you get the feeling at that point were they a, a band? Or they were sidemen to Ozzy Osbourne. How, what was your impression of, of, of oh, them? Oh, as far as I knew, as far as I could see, it was like a band. You know? okay. I mean, uh, you know, everything that, everything basically that uh, uh, Lee used to say and that Bob still says is basically true. I mean, uh, and I don't know the motives. I don't, I don't know if 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 it, you know Sharon's story is that they were never going to be in the band and all this kind of stuff. And I don't know if that's true or not. I, I, I have no idea. As far as I'm concerned, when they showed up, it was Blizzard of Oz, the band. And uh, that, that's the way it was all laid out to me. I, I don't know what was going on in the background. I know it was with Jet Records. And I knew, of course, there was some little bit shady business going on with Don. <laughs> you know, indeed, Don sued me later on for, <laughs> for numerous reasons. And, when he wasn't getting sued. Well, you know. You're not. It's, it's like a rite of passage, really, for that. Person. If you're not getting sued, you're not trying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you, if you're not sued, you're not there yet. So, so, so this, so you have Lee Chris Lake, who you know, Bob Daisley, who's been around the block. He's a professional, right? And yeah. just so you know, I've talked to Lee many, many times. You probably know that. Bob, we talked to a few times. Yeah, you yeah. Know, I, we, we, I think we pretty much covered the whole Randy Rhodes. I've, I've spoken to the brother, the sister. I've. You know, uh, yeah, Kelly, Kel. Garney, Kelly Garney. I, I, I'm a Randy Rhodes fanatic here. Okay, <laughs> like, like I'll talk to anybody who's had a history with Randy. Ron Sobel was best friends with Kevin Dubrow. Was friends with Randy Rhodes. Yeah, I, I'm just like, what was your impression? Here's this young guy out of nowhere, right? He doesn't have a name for himself yet. What did you think? And you're a professional well, too, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, just a very earnest, uh, honest, straightforward guy. You know, I gotta say, the whole band were very straightforward guys. Ozzy's very straightforward. He's a funny guy. The band is funny. They they're in there having fun. They're all great players. You know, I, I mean, it's just a great situation. And uh, basically, everybody's on the same side. We're all looking to try and make the best possible record. And and it was just a lovely time, really. And um, Randy uh, was constantly pushing himself to get better, constantly practicing, playing. He, he, he'd, he'd sit there at dinner with a guitar and, and be just playing the guitar, you know, when waiting for the pudding to come out, you know, stuff like that, you know. <laughs> I, I, the, guy was, the guy was playing the guitar morning, noon and night 
and yeah. you know uh, did, did he seem it, homesick did he seem homesick like he was missing his family i mean there's a lot of that because he was off uh, he never is from my understanding I don't is, know. that might be just a family like hoping that he was homesick maybe, <laughs> yeah, yeah. he didn't seem that homesick to me you know he was hanging out having a great time he was he was doing what he wanted to do and um his, uh, I guess it was Jody, his girlfriend at the time. Yeah, 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 she yeah. came down. I think that was more towards the second record. But you know, um, you know, I, uh, I, I don't think he was really that homesick. I mean, maybe he was. I, you know, I, he never mentioned it to me. But um, uh, you know, basically, he was working all the time, and um, he was doing what he loved. So you know, it wasn't really work to him. But you know, uh, I remember that we set up. Um, he wanted to rehearse the solos, so uh, I would make a, and this is it's an old story, but I, I I would make him a a half a, a quarter inch two track mix of fifteen seconds before the solo all the way through the the backing track, and and then fifteen seconds after the solo, and I would make about fifteen or twenty of these uh, copies onto one big long reel, so that he would be able to play it. Uh, but we didn't have a remote down in the studio so he would go up to the control room and and hit play and this thing would go for about it was at seven and a half ibs so it would go for probably about 45 minutes and there would be uh, maybe 10 or 12 or 14 runs of the yeah. solo and then he'd go down and he'd play the solo and then he'd wait for the next one to come up and then he'd play it again and he would just practice and practice and practice and while he was doing this we would go this would usually be after dinner we have dinner about 5 30 6 o'clock and then uh, he would go back into the control room and, and put on his tape and we would go up to the pub for a couple of hours and have a few beers and then we would come back and say, hey, you know, are you ready? <laughs> and, he'd, and he'd be like, no. And so we'd you know, wait around for a little longer and then, you know, then I would be like, Randy, what the fuck? <laughs> you know, and, and then when we started to put down the solos, uh, we we'd get one really good. Uh, did, did he map it? Did he map it? Like a lot of guitars yeah, map it. Written out. I mean, the actual solos were written out. Yeah, the end solos, of course, were, were mostly uh, ad lib, but uh, the actual solos were worked out and written out. Uh, not so much written out, but it, he knew what was mapped going. Out. Yeah, yeah, they were mapped out, and um, uh, so we we would get a really good one, and uh, he didn't want to punch anything in. Uh, I think we did a few punches, but for the most part, he would try and do them beginning to end. And once we got a good one, you go, okay, let's double it. And I'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, wow. See how this goes, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but he would do a really good job of doubling it. And then he go, then he said, oh, let's triple it. And, I'd be, and I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> because you've only got 24 tracks, um, which is only 23 tracks because you've got time code on one of the tracks. And then, and then you've got, where you've got kick, snare, hi hat, stereo tom, stereo overhead. So you've got seven tracks of drums. Then you've got bass, two two bass tracks. So you're not looking at a lot of tracks here. Yeah. So and then you've got a couple of rhythm tracks. And then you know by the time you get to the lead, you're looking at about three or four tracks that you've got open. Yeah. 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 And so Ozzy freaked out when you know he he came up to listen. And he, you know, started doing his Aussie, you know, groove, you know. <laughs> and uh, he goes, what the fuck? And I said, oh, it's triple tracked Aussie. And he went, what the fuck? <laughs> Randy? And Randy be like, and we were like, and Aussie was like, fuck. It's, so, you, you know, he you was could say Aussie, Aussie had a lot, like a lot of people think Aussie just, you know, wasted somewhere in a corner. But I mean, he was there. I mean, right? Like. Oh yeah, yeah. I, you know, everything had to, everything went by Ozzy. You know, if if Ozzy liked it, it was cool. If he didn't, if, if he didn't like it, then we'd fix it. You know, I mean, uh, certainly uh, it wasn't just like you know, fucked up and in a corner. Well, yeah, yeah. not always. Well, not <laughs> always. <laughs> I mean, not you know, I mean, we do the vocals, and it might take. Uh, and Ozzy does one line at a time, and then he doubles it. Okay. So. Uh, that's why you had on the original album, you had like, oi, oi, oi. And there was only mm -hmm. three of them. Then when they did the remix, they somehow they echoed it. So it was like, oi, 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 oi. Mm -hmm. But it, when he originally did it, we were working with just two tracks. So uh, he would do the, he'd go, okay, 
okay, roll it. And he'd sing the first one. And then he'd like hold his hand up and I'd stop the tape and he'd go, how was it? And I'd go, yeah, not bad. I was like, do it again. So he punched the first line again. And maybe after two or three takes, I'd go, yeah, pretty good that one. I was like, all right, double it. <laughs> so I put him on the other track and he doubled okay. the first line. Oh, okay. And he'd go, how, how was it? And I'd go, not bad. I was like, do it again. And then you do it again, and we get that tight, that Aussie sound of his vocal, which he had, which he's been doing for many, yeah, many yeah, years. Sure. That yeah. tight double, and that's his sound, even from even from Black Sabbath. So you get one, and then you hear the sound, you hear it phasing, flanging with itself, and you go, yeah, that's a good one. As you go, what right, next, next line. So you do it, you do the vocal like this. It takes about six or seven hours to, to do the vocal, yeah, right, and yeah. in between, he's having a slug of scotch. <laughs> or, you know, or doing something else, mostly having a slug of scotch. Sure, sure. And I remember I would punch in and he wouldn't be singing. <laughs> and I'd like solo it up real quick and crank it up and I could hear this hissing sound. And he was actually just standing there taking a piss on the floor by the side <laughs> of the mic. And we'd like, do it again. So I'd be like, oh shit. And then uh, one of the times I, I punched in, he was throwing up. But, you know, most of the time he was very good. And actually, uh, we did have a chance to listen to those multi tracks some years, many years later, actually. And they are actually exemplary. They're really, really good. I mean, his singing is really good. There's no tuning on any of that stuff. That that stuff is as it is, you know. Yeah, that's what and, it was uh, back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. What, and uh, what, what, what about Mr. Crowley, the intro? So Bob, Bob Daisley told me that it was written, kind of mapped out by another keyboardist and then... Don Airy took it to the next level and recorded it. Is there any truth to that? Um, I don't know, actually. It's quite possible. Um, I know that Don came in and uh, he. we were very excited because he had a CS80, which was a uh, multi-timbre, you know, multi-note uh, uh, multi synthesizer, which was very new at that time. And it also had the, the strip where you could do this, the glissando thing, you know, you could do the sliding thing, it had that like uh, weird uh, sort of uh, like Velcro strip on the top. Yeah, you, no, like, no, it's, it's, it's a great know, intro. It's all, oh, it's yeah, a beautiful sound. And, uh, yeah. So that was very, that was very cool. And it was a, uh, uh, I forget what they call it, but it had, it had like eight voices. So you could play eight notes at once, whereas, you know, normally it was like a mini mode of one note at once. So that was very uh, awe inspiring. And um, so I don't know who wrote that actually in the first place. So I, I can't. No, I, I don't know if they necessarily wrote, but it kind of mapped it out. And then he took it and he just embellished on it. I think that's what Bob was saying. I just I don't want to mislead anybody either right but uh, yeah. what i think i mean the first time i heard this album it was you know from the opening chords of i don't know it's the sound is just so clear and so powerful that's what struck me the most about that album is just it's a the sound is great yeah yeah um well uh it was a good studio um uh, we had good mics uh it was a new ssl 4000 and a lot of people are saying oh you must have used all these great mic preamps and all this kind of stuff. And I said, no, we didn't, I didn't use any mic preamps. I, it just went into the console and that's the way it was. Um, uh, uh, you know, 90% of this stuff comes from the player, drummer, bass player, guitar player. You know, you, if you've got a great drummer, bass player and guitar player, you don't need to be a great engineer to make it sound. <laughs> this shit sounds good. That was the case. Is. That was definitely so, the know, case. A lot of you. a lot of the you know a lot of the reason that that record sounds so good is because the players are fucking good, and and, yeah. and that that that's really what it is. I was just you know I I just get a clear clean signal, no distortion, make sure it was good. You know that's and and you've done ninety percent of the work right there. You know maybe a little. Yeah. But here I mean. There. What's the fine line between engineer and producer? Like a producer can also be a project manager in a sense that he's got a budget and he's got to deliver a record, but a producer could be like a Mutt Lang where he's doing the engineering, teaching everybody how to sing the melody lines, getting the best performance. What What's the fine line there? Uh, well, it's a good question. And that line can move around. Uh, uh, basically, uh, if there's no producer or if the band are producing themselves, then the engineer has more of a responsibility to 
to understand what's going on and to mirror what the band wants. Uh, if you're there with a producer, uh, which I've, I've, and I've been in both cases, obviously, um, then you basically do what the producer says and you try not to step on anybody's toes and you, you know, so, uh, the engineer is basically just responsible for making sure that the, that the, uh, nuts and bolts of the, of the recording are correct. Uh, there's nothing distorted. Uh, press record, press record, right? Like exactly. you said, don't you forget to press, press record. record. You press record at the right time. You don't <laughs> run out of tape, you know, all these yeah. kind of, that, that all, that, that don't exist anymore. But the engineer's job is, is, is as an engineer, he's like, uh, he's like, uh, you know, the guy on the enterprise, you know, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm running out of dilithium crystals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that, that kind of deal, you know, Squatty. you're just responsible for the nuts and bolts of stuff. And you're not going to make a comment on, well, I think there's too many choruses or the verse is too long or that, you know, or the vocal could be better, you know, something like that. But uh, having said that, uh, it's there's a synergy that exists between the producer and the engineer if you're working as two separate people there's always a synergy that exists and often the producer will look at the engineer and there's a there's an unspoken kind of uh, rapport that you know you know a, a lot of people will look at the engineer and most of the time you try and stay deadpan but if something really sucks you know you look at the engineer and go yeah, that sucks. <laughs> and you can tell by the engineer's face that it sucked, you know, so there, it, it's an encroaching thing sometimes, but, uh, you know, uh, there's also a, 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 an etiquette involved and, and you try to make sure that uh, you don't uh, step on people's toes. And I did, uh, for instance, I did um, uh, uh, Enola Gay with Mike Howlett uh, with uh, Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark. I did that. Yes, yes, uh, yes That, re that yes, record many, yes, many yes. years. Um, and Mike Howler actually was really busy planning his vacation uh, at the console. He was looking oh, okay. at brochures and stuff like this, and he, was, it, he seemed uh, somewhat disinterested. So at that point, as an engineer, you you step up a bit and you make sure the stuff gets done correctly. And, yeah, and you know, yeah, yeah. so so basically, your job is to be the glue and to, to fill in where you see that there are deficiencies and, and to try and make up those deficiencies. And that, that's, a, that's a reasonable expectation of an engineer is that uh, he should be able to, to, to fill in the gaps. And, and obviously you don't wanna try and get the engineer to produce it if, he, if you're not paying him to produce yeah. it. Because at a certain Because that's point, right, another credit, right? It, like, <laughs> well, like the, the engineer gets a royalty, I would assume, or a credit, and then the producer gets a credit, isn't it? Like the more well, sort the, of... Well, the engineer usually does it. Well, in those days, it didn't work like the engineer did not get a royalty. The engineer would get a fee. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. And the producer would get the royalty. Yeah. And the producer's fee... But if, they that, dump, but if they dump the producing on the engineer, then they don't have to pay the producer fee. That's what Well, one of the things that was taught to me by my erstwhile manager back then, Andy Gould, who managed uh, Pantera and a bunch of other bands. That's a whole other story, Pantera. I have to tell you that one at some point. But, well, that's going to be in part two. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, one of the things that I started to do was I would charge an engineering fee, which was non-recoupable. So I would charge $10,000 in engineering fee for the album, which I would get, and they could not take that back. And then you would charge your producer's fee, which might be 50,000, let's say, and three points. Mm -hmm. And the 50,000 was recoupable against the three points. So if the, if you, if the record didn't make you $50,000 on the three points, you didn't get any more money. Yeah. And, you know, so you had to recoup that before you got any more money. So one, one is a royalty, Split and one is a, a an engineering yeah. thing. So I'm going to ask well, everybody. It doesn't work Bl like that anymore. Blizzard of Oz questions, everybody. And there's people texting, and I've, I've been paying <laughs> oh, attention to you. Good. Yeah. There's people, a lot of people texting. I'm just not keeping up because uh, there's just I got like a thousand questions. But Alan, go. I don't want to. No, I guy. thought you were going to read one. Well, I'm I'm going to read mine then. <laughs> <laughs> all right you sure. have you looking at me you looking at me looking at you and you have you said it all i mean the old stories of where the origins of these songs were why they weren't included on the album and they were released on the ep almost a year later or less than a year all, yeah. 
Uh, I think they were both B-sides, as far as I recall. Okay. Were they uh, recorded in the same sessions as the Blizzard of Oz sessions? That's what I'm getting uh, at. Well, um, I know that one of them we did down at Southampton when we were doing a live show. I went down there with a truck, and we recorded the, uh, a live show down there. And we, we had one uh, track, that, and then Randy came into the truck, and plugged into a pedal and did the solos on it. And um, that was one B-side, and I don't know which one of those it, it was. There are, there are many historians that remember all this stuff. But Probably, much yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's all good. And then um, uh, they were out on tour, and they came back into the studio to do a couple of B-sides because they had singles, and they didn't want to you know, bust out the, all the tracks on the singles. So we needed some B-sides, and... Um, I remember that uh, they came in. It was like a three-day uh, thing. And I remember Ozzy came in, and they, they were all kind of beat. The road, they were road beaten. And um, Ozzy went up into the control room, and I was setting up the drums and setting up mics. And, uh, and then Ozzy came down, and he was, uh, he was uh, a little drunk. And he came down, and his, the front of his pants were all kind of wet. Uh, so I guess he'd like weed himself and uh, oh. he, he, he went out the door and I was like, all right, well, I'll see you later. I said, so I went up into the control room and sat down to like, listen to the drum stuff. And, uh, and I thought, oh, it's nice and warm, the seat. And then the seat went oh, really cold. Man. And I realized that he, he'd actually, you know, wet the whole seat as well. Oh, so that man. was, uh, I was like, oh, motherfucker. Yeah, yeah, he just left. So, he, so, he just walked out and left. Oh, man. I was like, well, he could have told me, you know. But, uh, <laughs> I guess so. It's but, not but part of the fun for him, right? There's lots of stories like that. And actually, I think that was one of the times that, um, or it might have been during the second album that, uh, I forget what we were doing, but Ozzy and I went out in uh, my little BMW to some pub out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, in, in the middle of the afternoon, and I don't know why, I, I, I can't remember the circumstance. So we went out there in the middle, just Ozzy and I, and went into this pub, and there's nobody in there, just Ozzy and I and the, and the bartender. And we're standing there, and we, we had a, we had a, a, we each had a pint of, uh, old, you know, whatever, IPA, whatever it was, and, uh, and Oliver Reed walked in. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, this is like the most, uh, it's the craziest thing I ever saw. And Oliver, Oliver Reed walks in, and I look around, and I go, Oliver Reed, and he goes, hey. And he looks at me, he goes, Ozzy. And Ozzy goes, Ollie. So we all sat there, and so we started drinking, and we were there for two or three hours and getting more and more and more drunk. And I remember at one point, Oliver Reed, a very, very nice chap, he said to, he said to me, he said, you're a bit cross-eyed. I said, yeah, I, I said, i got a lazy eye. I said, so are you. He goes, yeah. So we were all laughing about that. And then he goes, I'll tell you something else. So he, he stood up, took his pants down, and he had a, a tattoo of a vine going down his stomach all the way down to the end of his, whatchamacallit. You know, your thingy. <laughs> oh, I was like, holy shit. So Ozzy goes, oh. So he stands up and pulls his pants, and he's got the same thing. Oh, he's, got a, he's got this tattoo going down. I'm standing there in the, in this pub in the middle of like in the middle of co English countryside with these two guys <laughs> with their pants down. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? You know, of course we were all like in stitches. We we're all laughing. Like, <laughs> the, the most amazing thing. And uh, Oliver Reed was very nice, a very nice guy, and he told us lots of stories about Shepperton and all the films that he'd done and all that kind of stuff. Of course, he's gone now, but uh, but a lovely guy, and it, it was. Uh, it was such a serendipitous moment. I, 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 I was just amazed by the whole thing. Incredible. Yeah, great. Just a great, great thing. Like, so everybody knows the sequence here. Blizzard of Oz was recorded. The band went on tour yes. in, England, in, in England, or actually UK, we'll say. Yes. And then they went back into the studio to do Blizzard of Oz. Uh, Diary, Diary of Man. Man. Diary Diary, Man. Yeah. Sorry. Diary, Diary, Diary. Sorry. Sorry. If it ain't Blizzard, broke, don't and, fix it. So, so Blizzard with Lee... Bob and Randy. Then they go do this UK tour with Lee, Bob and Randy. Yes. I think they recorded a few shows there too. And then they went back to do Diary of a Madman. Yes. Right? That's the sequence, right? 
the success of the first album, because it came out as an import, I believe, in Canada at the time, and then later on it was released. So you're building off the success of the first album. What What's the sort of the mood like going into the second? Yeah, what's, the, what's the camaraderie like? Yeah, well, oh, there you go. What's uh, the camaraderie? Well, uh, we're all very good friends, and uh, nobody had any particular gripes. Uh, everybody was having a good time. And actually... Um, it, it, looking back, it might look that there was a, this big, it was a, all of a sudden they were huge, uh, but actually they weren't. Yeah. Uh, it, it was just sort of, they were still sort of getting out on the road and doing some touring and nobody knew uh, if it was going to work or not. Uh, they had a lot of problems uh, getting that record sold. You know, uh, everybody turned it down. Eventually, of course, Jet picked it up, Don Arden picked it up, but uh, there's a, there are, there are quite a few people in the music business even now that will can show you the rejection slip for Blizzard of Oz. And uh, of course, to their chagrin now, of course, but uh, right. uh, so there wasn't, it wasn't uh, uh, this big, oh, we, you know, we, we, we got fucking guns and roses. You know what I mean? It wasn't yeah, like yeah. a, you know, appetite for destruction kind of deal. It was very much a sort of a, well, the first record's out there. We did some touring, you know, let's make another good record and, you know, let's see how it goes. You know, it really wasn't, um, uh, it wasn't a huge a, success. A, a one hit wonder sort of like. Yeah, that. exactly. It wasn't, it wasn't a big, huge success. Um, it seemed to be getting some good uh, reviews from America, you know, uh, uh, but uh, as far as I was concerned, this was kind of somewhat dated material. At this point, I was listening more to Return to Forever and Weather Report. Uh, yes, and the more more advanced and more uh, progressive bands, and so to me this was uh, uh, more seventies kind of rock music, and um, so to me it wasn't anything particularly new. It was it was done very well, and the songs were very singable, and the songs were kind of uh, you know due to due to due to the whole band really. The the songs were uh, very accessible, and they worked really well and everything just fell together. But I don't think anybody at that point, when we started to make the second record, nobody was really saying, uh, oh, you know, we're, we're the fucking, you know, we're the biggest in the world. And, you know, this is gonna be another appetite for destruction or, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, or, or yeah. anything like that. So uh, it was very much a sort of get in there and try and, try and do what we did before, but better. And uh, it worked better. Uh, uh, there was more production in it. Um, I got better over the, over the year uh, in between. Uh, we did uh, Rough Diamond with uh, uh, Bad Company. Bad Company, yeah. Right, right in between that. And, a, a lot uh, of people, there's this myth that these albums were created right beside each other. Sort of like yeah, I, I, one I album and then three months months. later the second album. There was actually a year, right, between or yeah, about a year. Yeah, it was almost a year. year probably about 10 months, I think, something like that. Yeah, it was like, it was the next year. It was 81 when we mm. when we did uh, uh, Diary. Diary, so, yeah. Uh, uh, it was, it was, the Diary was better. We had, um, at that point, we had um, a, uh, a Lexicon 224, which is a better reverberation unit. I had a little more time on the AMS, so I had a longer digital delay. Uh, we had a couple of extra boxes in there, so we had more toys to play <laughs> with a little bit. Um, Randy had uh, progressed and evolved with his uh, chip pan pedal, so you know that that he had more fucking boxes plugged in down there that made more noise, <laughs> and uh, so there was you know a few things like that, and, and also. Um, as you say, there was a bit of camaraderie and we all knew what to do and we all got in there and just set it up and we started working. And uh... That's what Ozzy, I mean, first of all, this is like the funniest autobiography I've ever read is Ozzy Osbourne. Right here. But he says in it, like you said earlier, he thinks it was all done within three weeks. Is what he meant yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, that's because the, the he doesn't remember. It over the phone. He was calling you and said, turn up the bass. It was kind of mixed over the phone. They were so pressed for time before heading back out on tour, it was according to his book. Yeah. Is that, uh, is that Diary, Alan? Was that Diary the or was that Blizzard? Record, uh, they were down by the pool and I would mix it. I would run a mix and put it on a cassette and, and they would take it down by the pool and listen on a, a ghetto blaster, uh, Bob Daisley's ghetto blaster. <laughs> and then they would come back with a few notes and stuff like that. And then the second one, they weren't there at all. Oh, wow. So uh, I was mixing on my own 
and, and actually even on the second one, I think there's a couple of tracks on there that I couldn't get any better from the rough mix. And I just told Ozzy, I said, look, you know, the rough mix is better than I can do now. So, you know, you know, know Rudy, Rudy Sarzo told us that when, when now, now they're touring America and you're rough mixing it, I guess, wherever you're rough mixing it. And as you were sending them to America, the tapes or wherever they were touring, Ozzy didn't like that sort of 80s bigger sound at first. Did, didn't Randy, Rudy say that, Alan? He goes, Ozzy was shocked that because it was a new sound, right? There was this new sort of more brighter, bigger, more uh, reverb. Yeah, well, it was more produced sound. Uh, it had more depth. It had more uh, depth. We, we did stuff like uh, Randy would, would do a, 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 a clean guitar in mono, put a big, long mono, six or seven second reverb behind it. And then when he would do another one, so we would get this tunneling effect. So a lot of this stuff was, uh, was uh, it wasn't as cut and dried, obviously, as Blizzard. And uh, so- It's a difference in production. A, there's a difference there. There's a difference. One is like, I love both, don't get me wrong, but one's more uh, bigger, brighter, better, per, you know, bigger production. You can see there's more value there, right? There's a bigger, and the other one's more raw and in your face and uh, yeah. tight, you know, yeah. Yeah, well, I think it's a, you know, it's always, you know, if you've got more time, exactly. you know, you're, you're going to, exactly. you're going to fuck around with it more, you know, so I guess we, we messed around with the second one more and we all got a little better at it and yeah, uh, yeah. what he was a little better and we, we wanted a progression. Everybody wanted it to move. We just didn't want to make another blizzard of ours. We wanted to make something that was, that was more uh, accomplished and, and more, um, more sophisticated, if you like. And that's really what we were looking for for the second one, I think. And, I remember, uh, I, I remember hearing "Diary of a Madman" the song for the first time on a big stereo system when it first came out. It was just the most epic sounding <laughs> song, I, you know, from from the beginning of that. You know, he does sort of borrow from Leo Brower, I believe. That sort of intro, that acoustic intro, right? I, yes. But he, but that's yes. part of Randy's charm, right? That's a neoclassical thing, right? To borrow yeah. little yeah. classical. That is a the little intro. The the intro is actually borrowed classical piece, an old piece, I guess. Yeah. And then the orchestra and the choirs, and then the build up. Yeah, just, just the, the the whole finale to that. Can you tell song. us about the making yeah. of that song? Yeah. Well, that. Um... Like I say, we, we're still only working on 24 tracks. So, uh, wow, we had, on 24 uh, tracks. Well, 23 tracks. So, okay. um, <laughs> we had, ended up, <clears throat> and they had warned me that we were going to put strings and choir on some of these. So, uh, I had four tracks to work with, basically. <laughs> um, uh, so, we went to uh, Lansdowne, which is where uh, Uriah Heap used to do all their, uh, all their recording uh, until they started working in the Roundhouse. But uh, Lansdowne, we went to Lansdowne to do the um, uh, the chorus, and we had an eight piece choir, I think, you know, the ah, 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 ah and all this. And um, the whole deal with that is it's session, it's musician union session. So, uh, what we would do is we'd do a run through, and then we would do another run through, but we would record the second run through, but not tell them. Okay, and then and then we keep that. And then we record another run through or actually do a take. But then now we would have a double track, but we wouldn't have to pay for the double track because they didn't know about it, you see. So, <laughs> right, right, so, right, right. <laughs> the old sneaky double track. The old sneaky <laughs> double track, yes. And that's what you had to do in those days because it would cost you, you know, it would cost you twice as much actually to do a double yes, track. Yes. They would charge you. So um, we went and did that at Lansdowne and then um, the, uh, all the strings was actually uh, <laughs> oh, so so funny. Uh, we did that at Abbey Road, and uh, so we all went down to Abbey Road, and everybody like walked across the zebra crossing and <laughs> fucking you know, did all the pictures and all that. And we're in there, and it was uh, Lou from um, uh, uh, from Electric Light Orchestra who who was doing the arrangement. And so we're all there, ten o'clock in the morning, and uh, we're in the, downstairs in the in the, where where the Beatles did the White Album. It's you know, it's all Beatles. It's like the yeah, the faders yeah, are like yeah, these yeah, big yeah. fucking circular things that you can you know that look like <laughs> aircraft aircraft things. You know, and um, we got twenty six piece strings out there. It's at London Symphony Orchestra string section, 
So 26 piece string sitting wow. out there, all these, you know, all these guys with, you know, with the, you know, dressed up and, um, I guess about 10, 15 and, uh, we're all standing around and we're looking at our watch and, and Louis, Louis Clark is not there. And, um, this, this, this is a big problem because you only got three hours. And so anyway, Louis walks in at about 10, 20 in the morning with two pints of beer and he goes, where's the copyist? So we go over there. He goes, right, come with me. So he gives the copyist a pint. He <laughs> takes a pint and he sits down at this corner table and he starts just writing, writing the stuff out, writing out the music at, straight out of his head. It's like Mozart. It's like Amadeus. <laughs> the guy, he's just, yeah, he just starts writing it out and he finishes a page and he throws it to the copy guy and he keeps <laughs> writing and the copy guy grabs it and he starts copying them out all by hand. We didn't have, you know, cause we didn't have Xerox or anything. <coughs> so, God damn, if within about 10, 12 minutes, he had the whole thing, he had the whole thing set up. All the, all the, wow. So, you know, uh, 13 copies and the master copy that Louis had himself. So he, he said, okay, right, you ready guys? Okay, so he goes out there, he stands on the podium, he taps his, you know, taps his uh, baton. He goes, okay, run through, he says, okay, run it. And he's drinking his beer and he goes, okay, run it. So they're like, and they will, and then, and th this this thing starts happening, and I'm just standing there. I'm not doing any of the engineering. I'm I leave it to those guys. I'm like I I can't work that fast. I'm not you know, I mean, and I've done orchestras before, but it's you know it, it takes me a lot longer to get the shit together. These guys they do it every day, so they just like oh boom 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 boom. They got eighty sevens up. They got you know whatever. They got forty sevens here. They got eighty sevens here. They got everything mic correctly. They got the guys sitting correctly. You know, and it, out comes a stereo mix of these strings. And once again, we do the whole, okay, run through. Okay, one more <laughs> run through and we record it. And then of course, we, and then we go to the other two tracks and we record it again. So we get another double track. And, um, and then of course, I had to go back to Ridge Farm and bounce those together in order to- Yeah, uh, so if people don't know what bouncing is, bouncing is taking multiple tracks and putting it onto one track. Yeah, and, you, you, and in those days, uh, the fidelity wasn't that great because you're coming off the record head because you have to be in sync. So basically, you're coming off the record head, which doesn't sound as good as the replay head, and uh, you can only really do it once, and you, you have to be very careful about the amount of generations that you go down. People don't know about this anymore, but um, you can't really bounce stuff more than twice on a multi-track, otherwise it starts sounding pretty bad. Okay, so. Yeah. Uh, so you got to get things right, and then you you're afforded one bounce really, and then incredible that, you could put that much music and sound so good. Yeah, and, and, and to, to this day you put that album on or even that song, and you're like, oh man! But that was maybe the magic back then, right? Now, I just want to know if yeah, go ahead. yeah, yeah I just want to know if Ozzy uh, soiled uh, George Martin's chair before leaving Abbey Road. <laughs> well. Uh, yeah, old George. Yeah, that's another. He's a master of that guy. You know, I did actually meet George one time uh, over in LA. But uh, what a fantastic guy that guy is, and uh, he he just did some unbelievable yes. stuff. You know, and no, I don't think uh, Ozzy. Uh, don't think Ozzy spoiled anything so on, that, on that event. But it was really a marvelous thing. And Louis, I, I mean, the fact that he was twenty minutes late and, and just pulled this out, and at one o'clock we walked out of there, we had the whole thing, and it was like we we're like, what the fuck. <laughs> it, was, it happened so quickly that we're all looking at each other like, whoa. And we didn't even know how good it sounded at that point. We were just like, oh, well, we got it. So, you know, and then we go back to Ridge Farm and do a little bouncing and consolidate stuff. And uh, we were like, oh, and, and the, the thing about that, uh, one of the things that makes it uh, work better is that it's done very quickly. So you take yeah. the first, you, yeah, you, I agree. you, you say, okay, I see what's going on. It needs to sound like this, boom. And you do it like that. And you don't second guess it. You just don't like the back. show, like what we're doing right now. We're just doing it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, you know, you do it at the spur of the moment and you, and you do what you think is right. And it's stuck down. And I always thought if you listen to like, if you listen to Led Zeppelin 2 and stuff like that, where Jimmy, he fucks up the guitar solo a bit, but he leaves it. You know, everybody left it. In those days, everybody just left it. It was like, yeah, you know what, near enough, move on. Yeah, 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 exactly. It has this sort of verity 
that 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 you don't get so much anymore because everybody wants to make everything perfect but it had that kind of just live verity you know truthfulness to it and you know i remember there was a there's an old story about clint eastwood with his when he used to direct, when he used to act and you know the director would say clint let's do another one and he would look at the director and go was i in focus and the director go uh, yeah yeah you're in focus you look at the dp and dp would go like yeah you know he said okay let's move on you know he, he didn't do more <laughs> than one true. one or two tapes that's organic that's organic well, yeah, you know, that's, a, that's a live performance in a and way it's right true. in a yeah, sense and it's, more, and it's truthful you, you get that live performance and you 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 can't say how many times you've listened to a demo and gone, dude, this demo is so much better than the finished thing. Yeah. So much better than the fucking one that we tried to recreate the demo. Yeah. You know, uh, Lee Kerslake, the, the brilliant Lee Kerslake, great drummer, a vocalist too, a singer. Yeah. How much, how much did he, he told us, you know, he did a lot of guide tracks for Ozzy on the, on the diary of a madman. Cause he, he participated more in the writing process, I guess on that album than he did on the first. Right. Did, did he hit? Did he? Did he um, assist him I, on the guy tracks? I don't recall him doing that much of that stuff. I think he did uh, quite some quite good work with the backing vocal stuff. Okay. And if there was some backing vocals to be put in there, uh, Lee was usually right there, and he'd be like, "Oh, you do this, you know, hit this note here, you know, whatever." Um, but to be honest with you, uh, pretty much all the melodies are Ozzy's melodies. Yeah, yeah. And you know, Ozzy's very sing song. He has that very sing song kind of. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, mentality and that's really kind of what kind of made those records uh well one of the things that made them very accessible is, is the fact that his 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 melodies are very accessible i mean it's yeah. kind of poppy really in a way these are like pop melodies over a metal and, and and a lot of people don't know this but publishing right it's the lyrics and the melodies no one cares about the drums or guitars. yeah yeah it doesn't matter yeah who writes the song who's considered the songwriters the guy who writes the melodies and the lyrics right so <laughs> in, in, in in what it is really it is ozzy who wrote that album the to the two albums that is that we're talking about and bob daisley who wrote the lyrics so not to say that randy he played a massive role i'm just saying what they consider you know publishing well, or songwriting right yeah, and that, you know that uh, when you say that, it's this is just the legality of it. But the, and exactly, it's the legality actually not really true. Like uh, I know that because um, a guitar like, solo on itself by itself is great, but it's not a song, right? You right. need the melody. Yeah, I mean the thing is, it's very much a symbiosis, and you know, Ozzy would never have written those melodies if he hadn't have had true. Randy writing You're right. the You're tune right. behind it. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, you know, there's a there's a whole thing about Sting and the police and um, <coughs> excuse me, what's his name? The guitar. We're tiring player. you out here. We're tiring. Take a break. Doing, <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Doing, <laughs> and, you, know, you know, every step you take, and uh, what's his name? The guitar player came up with that Andy whole Summers, thing. Yeah. yeah, and and basically didn't doesn't get any of the royalties yeah yeah and that's yeah. really the whole song it's the same as uh led zeppelin stealing uh spirits you know yeah. stairway to heaven right yeah um you know so it's really an unfair thing yeah that it ended up like that but that was like that's way back in the motown days and all that other stuff so that's a whole other conversation about why <laughs> it's like that yeah. but um i don't know you know if that's true then it's about the melody and the lyrics, then, you know, Herb Alpert, I guess, gets only 50% of whatever he writes because there's no lyrics. But so, right, right. So it doesn't really make sense. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, uh, that was never really a fair thing, I don't think. I mean, I think that if you listen to Purple Haze, half of the song is the riff, you know, but that would not be included in any of the royalties, you know? So, and anyway, Jimmy stole that from somebody else, actually. So, you know, <laughs> But you know what I'm saying? And so did and Led Zeppelin Jimmy, with everything <laughs> everything they ever did. That's why Jimmy Page said, you know, you know, because Robert Plant said to him, you know, what about, you know, when he when they did Stairway to Heaven, he said, he said, look, we kind of stole this. And he goes, just keep walking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a famous thing. And, you know, well, and Jimmy well, again, Page knew because he understood the law. And he yeah. said, listen, you know. You, we're not going to get nailed for this. And they're almost going to get nailed for it now, maybe. Well, I hate to yeah, say it, yeah. but the intro to Diary of a Madman, right? 
I don't want to get there. I don't want to go there. But Mozart. it is. It's 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 no. It's uh, what's his face? Uh, it's, it's, no, Lee Brower. Lee, Lee Brower. Yeah. But that's not our. That's not our thing. That's not our domain. Well, right? you know, and the thing was that after the Aussie albums, those those two albums came out, they were stolen again and again. If you listen to the final countdown, Europe. Uh, yeah. You know, da -da 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 it's exactly the same as 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 you know one of Randy's things. I mean, it's an actual total rip. <laughs> you know, it, it's like, dude, you just took the whole thing and made it into a new song, and you know, because you're writing new lyrics and putting a different melody, then now it's a new song. But to me, that's not that fair i mean you should give people you know kudos for writing a great riff you know i mean what about smoke on the water i mean the riff yeah. is a whole out the yeah, riff is yeah. the whole song yeah you know every guitar but, shop but but he but you know you know i guess he doesn't get any money for it i don't know who knows he probably does get money for it yeah he probably does it you know alan did you want to say anything else on the diary no, no, no. Just uh, like you said, two phenomenal and uh, historic albums that are really uh, groundbreakers. So. Well, you know, and, you know, people ask me this all the time. And I got to tell you, if you've got a great band, it's fucking easy. You know, you got a great band. They're smart. They're writing good stuff. You know, that's what you need. Like uh, like the, the, the like Megadeth with Nick Manzer and, and Marty. You know, this was a great fucking band, you know. This band could do no wrong. It didn't matter what this band played. It fucking it, it always worked. It always sounded great because these were yeah. great. It was just a great symbiosis, you know. Yeah, you so know you, when you that's get a these great good... point. Yeah. Hey, that that's a great way to start the part two somewhere down the road, right? We'll take uh, dissect all these bands and all, all these well, other great it. albums. That's you've right. Done. Oh yeah, we got we got tons. <laughs> we're gonna have to do like a six parter mini series here. <laughs> we'll do it by uh, country. Uh, so so where were you? So these two great albums are released. Now Bob and Lee are out because of their, you know, I guess there was a little bit of complications there. We won't get into all that. Everybody knows the stories. Tommy comes in, Rudy comes in. They're on tour in the US and the tragic, I mean, tragic accident of Randy Rhodes. Where were you when you found, heard the news? If you want to talk about it, if you don't want to talk about it, that that's cool too. Uh, no, actually I thought about this and... Um... Uh, yeah, I was very, uh, obviously very shocked and, and disappointed and, and uh, saddened. Uh, uh, I was sitting out the back in, in Ridgefield about Randy and I said, no, what happened? And he goes, oh, he got killed. And I'm like, holy shit. I'm like, what happened? You know, so he explained what happened. I, and I said to him, I, I remember saying to him, what's Ozzy going to do now? Because Randy was such a huge part of those first two records that you know, I, I was like, oh, my God, you know, this is, you know, not only is it awful that he, he, he's been killed, but it's awful for Ozzy. And yeah. in fact, it actually did end up being awful for Ozzy because after that, it kind of just started to slow down. And, uh, well, we, he, had, he had a pretty good time with Jake. And I think Jake kind of worked as hard as he could. And that's probably what you're going to ask me next is, uh, <laughs> you know, we're the off to Brad the Gillis next, but anyways, uh, <laughs> I, I I just to me, I, you know, I, I was probably like I think fifteen years old at the time. I was following Ozzy since, and it was to shock. It was like the first real rock and roll hero of mine that tragically passed, right? Yeah, and I think I, I think I was even in Florida that year, like when that happened, like the month later or two, and uh, it was just, it was, it was just. It was just devastating. It was just yeah. It was, and it was to this huge... day, it's devastating because yeah. it was so tragic. Yeah, it was a huge shock, and I remember I couldn't understand it because actually I'd spoken to Randy about three weeks before, because um, uh, I forget where I was. Right? I I forget where I was. I think I was at, maybe at Ridge Farm or something. But I spoke to him on the phone, and he was saying, "No, we're just winding up the tour," and he actually said to me, "He said I, I think I'm going to get the train home." from Florida. I think the tour was going to end in Florida. And he said, Down I think there. I'm going to get yeah. the train home to LA. He said, I don't like flying. He hated flying. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, years later, I found out, uh, basically talking to Lee, that um, um, it was, uh, uh, 
what's his name, the keyboard player, Don, Don who, who persuaded him to go on the plane. And Don, uh, 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 I found out has been in therapy for, for many years because of that. Uh, and I feel very sorry for him because, and, and I, at the time, I could not understand why Randy got on that plane because he hated planes. He was very, very afraid of planes. And I just couldn't understand it. And I guess Don Airy persuaded him to get on the plane. And uh, I think I think Rudy Sarzo in his book said there was a struggle. Like Don Airy saw, it was a Don Airy who saw a struggle in the cockpit of the plane. Like maybe it was veering towards the bus and Randy pulled it to veer towards the house. Anyways, that's just, you know. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can't confirm that. I'm just sort of. Yeah, from memory I, there here. was a lot of. I, I went to see Ozzy uh, sometime after that. Uh, uh, we were do, working on the tribute record, and I went up to Don's Don's uh, compound up in the hills there in L.A. And um, uh, I was having a few drinks with Ozzy, and he was saying that he saw Randy actually in the wreckage in the yeah. garage trying to get out, and these kind of things. And you know. <sighs> I take all that stuff with a pinch of salt. Uh, I think it's very easy to, for witnesses to to imagine stuff or think of stuff. And yeah, I, yeah. I have no idea. I mean, yeah. You know, yeah anyways, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I, you it's know such a maybe that's loss. true. Maybe it isn't true. I don't know. It's just a horrible thing, and and uh, you know, it doesn't really bear repeating that much. But you know, hey, I, I I could never understand. I never understood why he got on that. So I can understand why Don was very upset because he felt very guilty about persuading him to get on there. And, and you know, I, I don't even know if that's true either, because I heard that from Lee. But, uh, you know, so who knows exactly what happened? I don't know. I think the guy was doing a lot of blow, the, the bus driver who was flying the plane. And if you've been doing blow and driving bus all night, you know, to get in a plane at 8 o'clock in the morning or whenever it was, that's that's just uh, you know you're not going to get me on that plane for sure. But, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. But, but you know what, people you, uh, people make happen. errors in judgment all the time. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Randy passes. Another record is owing, and that would be a Speak of the Devil, or I guess in England, Speak to the Devil. Um, well, we did um, talk of the devil. Talk of the devil. Is it talk, talk of, of the, the devil? devil yeah. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. we did uh, Bark of the Moon before that. Hmm. No. Uh, and um was it bark at the moon no 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 because brad gillis was in uh speak of the devil yeah yeah we did uh bark at the moon and no, no. Uh, well, speak of the devil bark at the moon and then tribute i think you're you're, you're you oh okay you maybe you're right i, I don't remember <laughs> alan <laughs> alan we need we need Too somebody here to break the tie here because <laughs> brad gillis replaced sir bernie tomei and then brad gillis and then Jake E. Lee, right? Am I uh, right? Okay, I, I, I'd right. have to investigate that. But uh, Alan, <laughs> Alan, bring let me put here. Let me run Alan's for right. one second. I got to take a pee real quick. Go yeah. right ahead, yeah. Alan. Sorry. Hang on one second. Just use the council. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. like Ozzy. Guys, it was was it not Blizzard of Oz? Yes, I, I Blizzard yeah, of Oz. Eighty two, eighty two was Speak of the Devil. And this should That's be right. 83, right? 83, absolutely. 83, yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's it. I mean, yeah. First about, it was you know. first it was first it was Bernie. Then it was Brad Gillis. And then it was Jake E. Lee. Yeah. Right. And then and, and like as Rudy said in his book, Rudy uh, he was getting excited because he was leaving Ozzy to do Quiet Riot. And Brad Gillis was like, Hey, want to hear my new band too? And they were listening to the, the Night Ranger, right? Yeah, yeah. And then and then Don Ozzy Patrol. was having a breakdown as everything was going on. But we'll tell Max that there, Alan. <laughs> well, um, Max. Okay, so I'm trying to, I'm trying Max, to Max, this is the timeline. Me and Alan have established it. We've looked at the numbers. We've looked at the dates. <laughs> okay. at the Blizzard, Diary, Speak of the Devil, because there it is, in 82. Oh, was, and then, yeah, Tommy and uh, Rudy are still in the band. And Brad Gillis is the guitarist for the album. And then 83 was Bark at the Moon. Okay, I stand corrected. It's okay. It's all right. You know time. what? You know you you've done so much work. Like said, it's such a long time ago. It's all good. I get mixed up too. Sometimes uh, my kids I don't remember the names. No. Yeah, the the thing about uh, uh, speak of the devil, uh, we uh, I got called up and they uh, uh, they wanted uh, they had a contractual 
obligation to Jet Records for two more albums. And um, this is basically Ozzy's way of just getting out of the whole thing, getting it done. And uh, so we did it down uh, downtown in New York. The Ritz. Um, was it the Ritz, Alan? The I Ritz? think it was the Ritz, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, uh, we had a truck outside. I uh, forget which truck it was, but uh, could it, it was probably... Uh, uh, I can't remember, but uh, we mix it in the power station. And, oh, no, right, no, yeah. record plant. I'm sorry, record plant. Record plant yeah. And and um, it, it was done very quickly. Uh, so I said, I said to them, I said, look, we're only doing one night, so uh, let's during rehearsals, let's run the whole set, and I'll record that as well. Yeah. And uh, it, it, so if there's any screw ups we got, at least we got a bit of an option, you know. So we did that. We took, we took the whole uh, afternoon set and then they did the, the show and the show was pretty good. Uh, but we did take uh, out of the, out of the whole thing. I think we took uh, five tracks, I think from the afternoon. And then I was faced with the uh, fact that the, there wasn't any audience there. We had to, <laughs> I had to, which, which is which was the thing back then. You got to right? build it up a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, so I had to add audience, and um, I had to uh, uh, kind of uh, doctor the ambience of the hall to make sure that it matched up with the other stuff. And uh, uh, but uh, and then uh, it was a very kind of low budget thing. So we went into a record plant, and I mixed. Uh, Ozzy came in and redid the vocals, and. He said, and he was listening to the, to Rudy's bass. I'm, I'm, and Rudy doesn't like me for this reason. Um, Ozzy said, Rudy's bass is fucked. And I said, he said, he should come in and redo it. I said, don't worry, I'll just turn it down. So it was sort of a Metallica mix. <laughs> So I go in Injustice the for all the pre injustice for all. Is that it? I could hear the bass there though. No, it's not a justice for all. There's no way. I hear the bass. Actually, because there isn't a second guitar, you do hear the bass. Right? right? Because yeah. that, that that's why you hear the bass. It's not a justice yeah, for but, all. But uh it wasn't uh Rudy, Rudy Rudy didn't play particularly well. I don't uh, not I'm not sure why. Uh I'm sure he plays better now, but at that point it wasn't particularly good, but I said, don't, don't worry about that. Let's just get the vocal right. And there was a couple of things with Randy that we had to fix. Uh, I, I mean, with... Uh, Brad, Brad, Brad. I'm Brad. About, about Brad. No, actually, Brad did a great job. Brad played brilliantly throughout the whole thing. Great guitarist. Yeah, he's a great player and very uh, very self-effacing, very very modest player and uh, just, just a marvellous, did a marvellous job. And... Uh, uh, so we mixed the, uh, Ozzy came in the afternoon, we'd spend about three or four hours tidying up the vocals, <clears throat> and then I would mix that side, the whole side of it, the first side, and then wow. at about 11 o'clock at night I'd be done, and i mixed the whole thing on Oratos, remember those little uh, four-inch speakers, mix the whole thing yeah. in there because the monitoring in that place was horrible, so I just mixed it on these tiny little speakers, <clears throat> and then we gave that side to the cutting engineer, the next morning, and he started cutting the first side as I was mixing the second side. We would do the vocals the next day, so we did four days uh, in um... just to stick at the Black Sabbath. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just to stick at the Black Sabbath. I'm surprised he didn't do Heaven and Hell just to stick at the Black Sabbath and to stick it to Don Arnold. <laughs> so um, I could say yeah, that. So we, I could you know, say so that. It, the whole thing was done in four days. And the second, I did the second side gave them that they were cutting it so it was cut and mastered on the fifth day they did the last side on the wow. fifth and there was that was it and uh we we walked off and we were done so for me it was a a, a six-day job to do you know i back. remember the <laughs> press the press on this was the seven day miracle yes yeah, that so was the press the seven day miracle in yeah. seven days they created this album <laughs> yeah Double album, yeah. Double album, yeah. I love it. I to this day, you know. I mean, okay, I got the CD here, but I got the album somewhere. And I, you know what? I think what makes it so cool is because it was, you know, live. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it maybe wasn't necessarily live as we know it traditionally, but because it was recorded on the spot, there was a yeah. live vibe, you know? Yeah, yeah, it, it was very much... Does uh, that make sense? Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, no, it does, yeah. I mean, it has, once again, it has the truthfulness of, of, of you know, it, it, there's no second or third takes, really. You know, it's just, it's what yeah. they did, and that's it. And uh, yeah, sure, it's like, really... an early, like an early uh, uh, Led Zeppelin album or something where they just yeah. they just take what they get. Roll and they go, the tape, oh, yeah, roll the tape. <laughs> Yeah. They, roll they the tape. Go, oh, Jimmy, roll the tape. Yeah, we got to <laughs> fix this, or we got to fix that. You know, they, you know, that, there wasn't any of that. You know, it was like uh, so. Did, so did, that did, was pretty did, fast. All right, so we'll move on to unless Alan, you have a speak of the devil question. No, 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 no. That's fine. We're moving along here to bark at the moon now. All right. Ozzy gets a new guitarist, Jakey Lee, and we just talked to George Lynch, and apparently he auditioned too, and. Uh, apparently he did. I didn't know that at the time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah apparently, and I'm sure and others. Bob did. Daisy. No, Bob Daisy mentioned to us that uh, it was Gary Moore that uh, suggested Jakey e. Lee for the band. Oh, I didn't know that either. Yeah. yeah, and yeah I, I knew they're... Gary quite well too. So yeah. Yeah. actually, Ozzy's first choice was Gary Moore before Randy, was he not? I yeah, think uh, he was. Don Arden. Well, yeah, Don Arden wanted Gary Moore in. Uh, teamed them up, but uh, neither one of them wanted that. So it was more of a Don Arden thing. Yeah, so according Mark, to Ozzy's book. So. Yeah, so, I don't know. I did hear that um, that Gary Moore was talked about, and um, but uh, I that's all. That's all I really heard. I don't know what the ins and outs of it. You know, you know what I found the most I, interesting. I don't think he would have been a good choice anyway because Gary's much sound. more his different own. sound. Yeah, he's, and he's his own guy too. You know, I don't yeah. think Gary wanted to be in particularly in a band where somebody else was the big guy. You know? Yeah, 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 that's it. yeah. yeah. Uh, you know what I, I found interesting when we talked to Carmen at peace, Carmen Apice, Carmen Apice, Carmen Apice, Carmine Apice, Carmine Apice, Carmine not, a big, not a big friend of mine, really. Well, anyways, well, <laughs> I remember speaking to him and he was telling us about his, his contributions. He was called in and probably wasn't at your stage. It was at the mixing stage of Bark at the Moon where Tommy sound, there was something about Tommy Aldridge's drumming that didn't fit the groove. And they brought in Carmine to tighten things up or to make it sound a certain way. And, uh, you know, I, yeah, you know. I, I don't know what happened there. I, I think that's uh, Carmine is blowing his own trumpet a little bit there. I, don't uh, know. I, I can't say nothing. Uh, they, the end of Bark of the Moon, it kind of dissolved a bit. Uh, there was a lot of we ran into some financial problems. We ran into we ran out of studio time at Ridge Farm. Uh, so I couldn't mix it there. So Bob Daisley and I flew to New York on the Concord mm -hmm. to mix. Uh, so it was very rushed. At the power uh, station. At power station, and I, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't really how I wanted it, and it was very rushed. And um, uh, we, I bought those, and then I had to go and master it, and I had to master it with uh, Harry Weinberger, who, who, who I'm. Not, I, I never really worked with before, and I would normally master with Bob Ludwig, and um, I didn't like the mastering, I didn't like the mixes, and uh, I took it back to uh, London and I had a meeting with uh, Ozzy, and there was a few other people there. Uh, Meatloaf was there, and we were hanging Meat. Meat. in North <laughs> London somewhere at the uh, North London um, Holiday Inn, the big Holiday Inn in, in North London, and. Uh, uh, Ozzy didn't like any of it, so they fired me right then. And uh, and I remember I had to give Jake a lift home, so I dropped him off somewhere in South London. And uh, he was saying, "Oh well, maybe we can get Martin Birch to mix it and all this kind of stuff." And I said, "I have no fucking clue. I don't know what you know." And so the whole thing kind of dissolved at the end. And then they gave it to, I guess, Tony Bon Jovi yeah, in the so, yeah. station and. Uh, that that guy is that, that guy has to me has no ears so I don't know what happened to that um, and uh, Jake will tell you as I will tell you that the original mix has had much more guitar and much less of the keyboard stuff. You know that was what going he on. did actually. We interviewed Jakey e. Lee and he said there was a fear that since there was an unknown, there was this unknown in the air that they weren't sure because Randy's gone now and Jake's a new guy. 
So they mixed down the guitars a lot. Yeah, really, I, they brought I it think down. That was, Tony, that was probably Tony Bon Jovi's uh, uh, idea, or maybe Carmine's idea. I don't know. Um, uh, the tracks are pretty good. Uh, there wasn't anything wrong with Tommy's drumming. I don't know where Carmine gets all that. Uh, I think uh, Carmine basically suffers from a lack of being a big guy. You, and no, being a big star. And, no, no. I, I, but, but keep in mind, you know, Car, since, it, Car, Car, but, Carmine uh, was brought in. Car, Carmine, just to clarify, Carmine was brought in. He wasn't to, to consult and to help. So yeah. I mean, he didn't he didn't offer his services. They they brought him in, you know, like they. Yeah, they yeah, him. but uh, you yeah. know, I think he was talking to Ozzy on the, down at the Rainbow or some 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 shit like that. I Whatever, know, I, I don't know, know what happened, I but know. I, don't know. I found all this out a lot later on. But so, okay, uh, I didn't particularly like the mixes. I mean, I, but everything was put together pretty good. So you know, it all worked anyway. It was a decent record anyway. Uh, uh, I don't have the original mixes that I did. I wish I did, but you know, oh, yeah. they they always end up getting redone anyway, as we saw with the mm. first two records. So you know, uh, I was oh, you know what? I was pleasantly surprised that Ozzy wrote everything by himself on one finger on the piano. Is that is yeah? That, <laughs> I was ple- right when the album came out. I remember, wow, Ozzy wrote this whole thing by himself: lyrics and music, and one finger on the piano. I go, wow, man, he's got an ear. Yeah, yeah, pretty good. <laughs> So, you know, it was a bit of a debacle um, towards the end of it. Uh, like I say, we didn't have enough. Uh, Oz, Sharon and Ozzy bought a Rolls Royce, and I think that's that sucked up a lot of the budget. <laughs> and, uh, and so we were, we didn't have enough time at Ridge Farm to finish it off or mix it. And so, we had, like I say, we had to fly to New York and do it. And then uh, that was, you know, doing it, flying to New York, going in the studio the next day. We had like five days or something to mix it. It was just... It just wasn't very conducive, and uh, uh, it didn't turn out all that good. And I didn't really like the mixes, and I especially didn't like the mastering. And that's no slight on Howie, or you know, and no slight on any of these guys. Everybody's trying to do the best thing, but th- that didn't work out for me at all. So, uh, you know, whatever. That's what happened. So, well, I mean, it's a pretty big album, regardless, right? It, it struck a cur- there was something done right. Somebody did well, something I, I, right, I, right? I certainly think that. Um, I certainly think Jake's a major force. Jake's a great writer, and he writes, and he's a great, great player. And um, yeah. I, thought, I was fortunate enough to uh, hook up with him again, like a couple of years ago or last year, whatever it was, with his uh, Red Dragon album. album. Yeah, yeah. I mixed yeah. his uh, mixed the last uh, Red Dragon album, and. Um, that's the first time I've seen him since I dropped him off and we were talking about Martin Birch <laughs> like 28 years ago, whenever it was. So, you know, and the first thing he said to me is, those, he said, are those driving shoes? <laughs> and I, I'm like, what? Anyway, so, but uh, that was really great to hang out with him. And he's, he's very, Jake hasn't changed over the years. He's a very modest guy and he does what he wants to do. And he's very, you know, he, he he very kind of doesn't like the music business because of that and because of the way they treated him. And he, he wrote lots of that stuff. And, and yeah. that's why it's good. And in a way, he is as much of a force as Randy was. And unfortunately, by this time, the, the, the die had been cast with, uh, with the whole management situation, if you like. And, and, and that was all, all became kind of non-musical and, and just all about uh, the money and how how best to you know fuck people over basically. And you know, I get yeah. into trouble. I get into trouble with this all the time. The last <laughs> time I was on, <laughs> I was on uh, what's his name show on Sirius. Uh, Eddie Eddie Truck. Eddie Truck? Eddie's, Eddie's yeah. And uh, and we were talking about the same thing. And <laughs> I was saying how badly I thought they treated uh, uh, you know um, the guys in Blizzard and. I got a cease and desist uh, text <laughs> yet the next day from Aussie's lawyers really? saying, you know, you better shut the fuck up or we're going to sue the shit out of you, basically. And this is what happens every time I talk about this stuff. But I don't give a fuck because I don't have any money anyway. So you can't get blood out of a stone. Well, so, well you, know, you know what? Um, you, you received a, a Medal Hall of Fame award along with Lee and Bob for your contributions to Blizzard of Oz and Diary of a Madman, you know, and, and these albums will go, and Ozzy included, and all the people who participated, these albums have gone down in history, not only in metal, but in hard rock, just in music, 
they have gone down in history as probably two of the greatest albums ever made, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's huge. That's huge. And Bark at the Moon, you know what? I would say it's a it's a close. You know, it's right up there too. You know, it, it, it's a great album. Yeah, and that's off to everybody. Been, as being a sort of a good third, and then you know, and then uh, after that, it seemed to tail off, and 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 I don't know if that's. I, I think that probably the main cause of that is the management sort of squashing the music and just turning it in, into a commodity. And, you know, uh, it, it, it was such a great band that first for the first two records, that band was so good, you just couldn't do any wrong. They could play any fucking song and it would sound really good. So, yeah. you know, that when you when you've got that, but they never seem to last that long. You know, very few bands that go more than a few years with having that kind of line of like cream or you know hendrix or or uh, you know the, maybe the stones is you know probably the the only one that keeps going you know yeah but, I but never stop. Like, <laughs> and you know you got like you know you see this happen all the time bands don't last that long you know they, they because of the personalities and what kind of makes them good is also what destroys them in the end, you know. So, yeah, you know, well you, well you see this, you see this, you know, happening over and over and over again. Like I saw it with Bad Company, and you know, they were breaking up at the time we were making uh, that Bad Rough Company, Diamond. Rough Diamond, and you know, that was just a, a debacle. And I watched Simon, I watched Simon Kirk getting punched by Paul Rogers, and it, it was just some awful, you know, awful Ooh. stuff, you know, and and. It, it's a real, real shame when you see that kind of stuff when it should all, you know. But but I got to say, the first few records, the mood of those records is great because everybody was in a great mood, and there were, everybody was a hundred percent into it, and 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 that's what you need to make these kind of records, and it comes through somehow. It comes through the music, even if it's an ambivalent song, it still comes through. The feel comes through. You know? The power, yeah. Like you said, they were struggling musicians at that time too. You know, so they had nothing well, to prove. They they weren't resting on their laurels. Laurels, I should say. They they really had to come up with the goods because they were still struggling. Yeah, and as, as far as I know, um, Ozzy's uh, Ozzy had thirty grand that he got from Black Sabbath when they when they fired him, and that was the money he used to make Blizzard of Oz. And that was that was that's fact. That's the story that I. I don't know if that's true. It could be just BS. But uh, as that was a story I heard, that he had this severance pay, if you like, <laughs> and he had just enough money to go and make a record, and, you know, find the people and all that kind of stuff. That's probably BS. But you know, it's a it's a kind of cool story. And uh, you know, and uh, the other thing that happened actually, you probably heard this story before. But I was in. I was waiting for them to show up, and we had the big side doors open. I was waiting for the truck to show up with the equipment. And this guy showed up in a car and I didn't recognize him. And I thought he was one of the roadies. And I said, oh, you know, sit in the control room. We'll wait for the, you know, the gear to get here and all that. And he was like, oh, okay, you know. And I played him some bullshit stuff that we've been doing there, which he hated. And uh, <coughs> fortunately I didn't say anything, but that was Aussie, but I didn't, re I didn't recognize him. <laughs> I, think I thought he was one fun. of the road crew. But, <laughs> And then when everybody showed up and they're like, hey, what's up? Also, I was like, oh, thank fuck. I, you know, kept my gob shut. You know what I mean? The but boss is here. <laughs> well, you know what? <laughs> Uh, there is a reason why I, people love Ozzy over these years. It's probably his melody, his you know, his sense, his humor. You know, his he's an icon, right? And yeah, he, he's a very very funny guy. I mean, he 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 would say many many funny things, and um, you know, uh, I remember him saying one time. Uh, he said, oh, you know, the doctor told me I can only have one drink a day. I'm up to April 2027 already. <laughs> you, know, like, you know, shit like that. He would just come out of these things and just really, really funny. I mean, guys are really, really funny and very astute. And then sometimes yeah. he'd just be like in, in a land of his own. And, you know, well, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just going <laughs> to leave you on this. I'm really happy that when you did, when I did meet you in person, you know, and you got, you did receive your award and so did Lee. He was in person. It's like you met, when was the last time you saw Lee Chris Lake? Uh, well, um, actually I had seen him about three years before because okay. Peter, Peter, what's the name uh, from LA was making that big uh, movie about Randy and all this yes, stuff. Yes, yes, I never got uh, Peter yet. Margolis, yeah, who was yeah, the yeah. producer, he's a producer in LA, and 
he invited me over to Ridge Farm and had Lee down there at the same time so we could reminisce and talk about the stuff. And they, they shot a bunch of footage there. And then uh, Sharon came down and just squashed the whole thing. And I think the guy's got like 200 hours of film. But oh. It was not allowed to cut it together, and it wasn't yeah. allowed. To use that's it, so. another. That's another lawsuit there. I don't even want to get into that. Yeah, yeah. I heard a lot, lot of stories on this, and and I guess yeah. on to end off the tribute to Randy as you know your your final I guess production. Yeah, well, well, did the ghost of Randy Rhodes, you know, come back? Yeah, that was here? that was kind of weird, and uh, you know, there was there were occasions after Randy died that we. We thought I was doing Y and T, for instance. I was doing Black Tiger. Right. Um, That'll be in part two of this. At, at uh, Rich Farm, <laughs> and we had, we were talking about. I was talking about Randy to um, uh, the singer, and <clears throat> it was at night. We were doing some solos, and he was talking. We were talking about Randy and the tones and this kind of stuff. And there was this big bolt of lightning. And it hit the power lines outside and just everything went out, everything went black. Wow. So we kind of looked at it, we were stumbling around in the dark with, you know, lights turning on, <laughs> lighting matches and, you know. And uh, I went and we turned everything back on, we got the power back on, we turned everything back on and there was no sound coming out of the, out of the speakers. So I went to the power amps and I pulled out the fuses and they were just, um, the fuses had just, uh, the, the metal wire inside the fuse had just uh, vaporized against the fuses. So that they were just, wow. they would just like, look like pieces of metal, actually, the fuses, that just look, the whole thing vaporized. So we were, I was talking to Minicaddy, Dave and I, we were looking at each other, we were like, were we just talking about Randy? And we were, like, we were like kind of a little bit freaked out by that. You know? <laughs> but of course, when we were doing a tribute and, um, they came down and they called me up and said, you know, can you do tribute? And I was like, you know, well, what have you done for me lately? You know, yeah. <laughs> but I was in New York at the time and uh, they, uh, uh, they said, okay, you know, we got this one, uh, they, they sent me two cassettes um, of, of purporting to be two different shows. And I listened to these two cassettes and one of them worked really well. One of them sounded really good. And the other one sounded like kind of crappy. And they said, which, which show should we use? You know, so I said, well, obviously we want to use this one. And they said, wait a minute, something weird's going on here. So I, I listened to him again and I realized that Randy made the same mistake in both of these tapes. They're actually both tapes of the same show, but mm. one of them, Randy was turned down. He was actually in balance with everything and it was kind of shitty, didn't sound that good. But the other one, Randy was really loud. And he was like very excitable, of course, on live, and, and he would play really on top of the beat. So if you try and put him back in the mix against the drummer, it's a mess because he's out of time. He's really in front of the beat. <laughs> but if you turn him up, it sounds really fucking good because he's driving the whole thing along, and you don't give a shit about the drums anymore. So <laughs> this this was a, so I said, oh, you know what? This is the same fucking this is the same show. It's a King Biscuit Hour show from out in the Midwest somewhere. You know, I actually, said, there was also the Montreal. Like well, that, that's what Montreal, I wanted. Right? To, that's what I wanted to ask you. In Rudy's book, it says it's from a Montreal show here at the Theatre Saint Denis, which is a great venue, and they they played in Toronto the night before, and they were fantastic. And this show, they they just didn't click, and he was surprised to say that that was what he thought in his book was released as tribute years later. The uh, guitar solo was in Montreal. I think the guitar solo was. Let's clarify well, this. As far as I know, no, and this was only from one show, I know because it was on one big 12-inch reel running at 15 IPS. Um, the whole show was on one reel. And mm -hmm. that means that uh, that would be uh, just over an hour okay. of running time. And there's no edits on the reel. So I know it's one show. And it was a King Biscuit show from, I think it was Cleveland. Wow, okay. So I, I don't know where the Montreal thing comes from, but I think that's a misnomer. I don't think that's true. I don't think it came from Montreal, as far as I know. And I remember looking at the looking at the box and it was a King Biscuit hour thing. And I believe it was Cleveland. So, but I, I could be totally wrong. Maybe it was- No, 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 no. Well, what I, what, again, they didn't have that much recorded live material with Randy. So it came really down to this one show, like you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, they, they gave me, Sharon sent me these two cassettes and I said, look, 
I said, well, we'll, we'll do it like that. And they gave me a great clue because it, it made me realize that I have to keep Randy way up in the mix, which of course is probably obvious, but you know, obviously you want to try and make it sonically sound good, which, so you want to put him in the right place, but you know, mixing is a devious thing. And sometimes it works better if, if he's too loud because it, musically it works better. And, you know, sometimes the, if, just because the balance is right doesn't mean the music is right, you know? So um, that was a good clue for me. And I said, okay, so we're going to do this. And there's one, uh, there is one place where he starts on, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, flying High Again. Uh, he starts the solo off on the wrong fret. And uh, he's actually uh, one fret down where he, from where he should be. And then he realizes and moves to the right place. But fortunately, he does enough repeats that I could take that piece and move it up to the front and overlay it on the piece where we was at. So I fixed that one. And at the time, I'm saying, I'm sorry, dude, but I got to fix this. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> hey, he understands. You know, no more I blowing hope, it. I hope you understand. No more no. power outages. Listen, listen to this. From Wikipedia, Max, the majority of tribute, and again, it's Wikipedia. It doesn't mean it's true. The majority of tribute from I Don't Know through Paranoid was recorded in Cleveland, Ohio on May 11th, 1981, with the exception of an extended guitar solo midway through the song Suicide Solution, which was recorded at Théâtre Saint-Denis in Montreal on July 28th and inserted into the song. Uh, the entire album had been recorded somewhere in Canada. That's what I was, This particular Montreal show had been recorded and released in 1981 from a radio program called King Biscuit Flower Hour. And then they say goodbye to romance, noble movies were recorded in Southampton in the UK with Lee Curse Lake and Bob Daisley. Oh, well, yeah, no, but I, I recorded those, yeah, in Southampton. Oh, okay. I did that in the truck out the back, yeah. No bone movies, yeah, that's where we did them. And, and Randy did the solo in the truck. Um, well, I got one reel of tape. There you and there go. Were no edits. So I I think that's uh, maybe yeah. maybe maybe because they thought there was two. The the solo came from Cleveland. Everything came from Cleveland. Everything came from one place, as far as I can tell. Yeah. And there's no cuts in there. And it wasn't second generation tape. It was running at 15 IPS. So if they'd have dumped it down a generation, it would be it would be a little bit dull. But uh, you know, and the other thing that happened was this really is Wikipedia. We, it's not. It's not factual. Max right? was there. It's, Max it's had not... it in his hands. That's all we need yeah. to know. I mean, that might have come from that might have come from Rudy, or I, I don't know where that comes from. But as far as I'm concerned, um, it was one show. The tape was. It, they went into record. When the tape ran out, that's when it went out of record. And, and there's yeah. no there's no edits yeah. in there. There's no uh, overdubs or anything. Um, and anyway, with that, we ended up with three sides because it was an hour. And then uh, we had nothing for the last side. And the only thing that I had uh, from Ridge Farm was uh, Randy doing D. Uh, yes. And I, what I'd done is uh, we just got some PZM microphones, those, those PZM microphones, which are boundary layer microphones with a flat they look like a flat plate and we just got some of those so we we're trying some of those out. i had a 451 on the acoustic and i threw one of those down on the floor in front of him and um i ran a, a quarter inch tape uh, at, at 15 ips for uh, a few hours while he was rehearsing it just to uh, so that he could go back and listen and mess around with it and basically that's what we put together for the last side was um those outtakes on a mm -hmm. and they were just on a two track they weren't there, there was no multi-track for that so yeah and nice. that's all we had we didn't have anything else they come back to me time and time again dude did you record anything else dude did you do i said nope that's what we did we only had this amount of time so we did exactly what we knew we had to do and that was it you know there you go wow you know, I think in an <laughs> hour, one hour and 40 minutes, we've covered the Randy Rhodes. There you well, go. Not the, 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 sorry, the Max Norman Ozzy era. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. There you yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. Is there, uh, you <laughs> know, I, I, people are sending questions. I just, I just, I, you know, I got. Well, we can do some questions. You want to do some All questions? All right. If people want questions now, fire them off. <laughs> it's a lot of conversation between people. If you, if you take a look here, let me just go through some questions here. We can do questions. 
All right, people, if you have any questions for Max Norman, now is your chance. He is here until he loses his voice because he's been talking for like an hour and 40 minutes. <laughs> I got to get back. I, you know, I have to do some work too, of course. Oh, today. let's actually from, as we, the, what are you, what actually, are you mixing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Uh, I'm actually doing Leader Ford's new record right now. Oh, oh wow. nice. So it's a concept album because we spoke to Lita Ford, me and Neil Turbin, we spoke to Lita Ford. She told us it was a concept album. It's, it's already public, this interview. And, but yeah. I won't ask you anything else. Yeah. Uh, Unless no, you want to tell well, us. I asked her actually, because um, I, you know, occasionally I do some interviews and stuff like that. And I said, yeah, is it okay? And she said, that's fine. Just don't tell them the title. Okay. So the title is, no. <laughs> no, but it, it's the actually runaway. really good. And it okay. sounds really great. And it's a very kind of modern thing. And it's a whole concept thing. And I think everybody's really going to enjoy it. It's actually really good. And, and uh, uh, all kudos to her. She's been making this record for a few years now, I think. And it's finally coming up and we're taking okay. quite a long time. We, I'm about four mixes. I'm just setting up the fourth mix right now. So Okay, so when do you think this album is going to be released? Uh, later, I would say, well, I would have thought that, you know, they're very, they're, they're pretty laid back about it. So and these days, you know, with the pandemic and everything and, and everybody yeah. working at home, um, uh, I send them a mix. A week later, I get a couple of notes about it and then I fix it and then I send it. you know, so it's like a week here and a week there and a week here. Uh, I think she's going out on tour in June. Wow. So uh, It I, is a concept album. It is a concept album, right? Yeah. It, yes, it is. Yeah. A, a loose concept or like a mine, I, my Operation Mind Crime kind of concept? <laughs> no, it's a kind of a, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty, uh, it's a, it's a pretty enclosed concept. Yeah. It, you know, yeah. yeah. How really... would you define, <laughs> how would you define the musical style of this album? Um, it's pretty modern, um, but you know, uh, they do quite a lot of uh, guitar harmony stuff. Um, and uh, uh, it, it's a pretty modern sound. It's not like a, it's not like a old school thing. Uh, a lot of people are going back to old school stuff right. now. I just got something from Oni Logan, for instance, that mm -hmm. was really old school, and they wanted it like Led Zeppelin. And I said, well, well perhaps you should play like Led Zeppelin, and then it's, <laughs> you know. But you know, <laughs> you know. So, and and I'm not particularly into that old school thing. I like to move forward. You know, people go, oh, it, it has to sound like Blizzard or it has to sound like this. And, you know, I, I don't approach things like that. It, you know, things have their own intrinsic qualities and the, the idea is to strengthen those qualities and not try and make it sound like this or sound like this. It should sound like it is, you know? And, and, and so I don't look to try and copy sounds like this. And, and this is a very new, kind of sound for me the drum sounds are very new and so it's uh so uh, really quite a bit quite an interesting album i don't want to say too much about it yeah, looking forward to it yeah monster you know, but, uh, she, she told us publicly monsters we were just recorded a song called monsters for the new album monsters is about charles manson types in the world who brainwash and take advantage of people this is what she told us publicly this is like an interview right i'm not uh, right, right. revealing anything and uh, that's kind of what she told us. And this Monsters was like, I just got. I think that's the next one I'm setting up. So I'm teasing oh, everybody. Go. That's what I'm doing. I'm teasing everybody. The <laughs> Ford up album. The suspense for the next Lita Ford album. Tell yeah, Lita we're going to interview really well, her and, and push it. Everybody's playing really good. And uh, it's really enjoyable, actually. It's very enjoyable. And I was, I was, uh, I'm always very pleased. And uh, when I hear, you know, older artists like Lita, and I shouldn't really, you know, call don't it say that, that. But, you know, the more, <laughs> the more mature that. artists. Yes, experienced uh, artists. It's coming up with stuff Classic. That's and fresh, you know. So, uh, you know, I don't want to hear her doing, you know, gotta let go again. I want to hear her doing new stuff. And this is really pretty new. And it's actually really good. I really like it. Good, you know? good. We're, we're looking for I think it. You're gonna, Max? Sonically, sonically, it's pretty amazing, actually. So I think. Your that, favorite you know, beer, Max. Your uh, fast questions before we end off. Your favorite beer. Okay. My favorite beer? Yes, sir. Uh, Stella Artois. Oh. I'm trying to find a question that's not going to require, you know, like a long story. Like they're asking about Megadeth and loudness, but we're going to say that for next time. So, um, yes, lots of stories about those guys too, of course. Uh, there's a lot. Oh my God, we got a lot here. And I, you know what? I'm going well, to have to do one every week, you know? <laughs> yes. <all> <laughs> 
next artist loudness <laughs> you know what we're gonna anyways we're gonna have you back we're gonna we're gonna go through your you know your your history the discography and, uh, discography yeah. and uh unless alan do you have anything left no after? it's just a pure pleasure like we were saying i don't know if jimmy pressed the record or not he had one job <laughs> to do <laughs> but we we're saying you know you're like the soundtrack of our adolescence always included max norman and everything we were listening to and i i can't wait to do part two and discuss a lot of those albums that i've got sitting right here uh, just w- willing to talk about well, yeah, you know, uh, I'm, I'm very, I was always very, uh, uh, I'm always very pleased if I go out, if I go to a show and some people will come up to me and recognize me and say, you know, and they, they say that, you know, I, I was instrumental in their kind of childhood or, you know, doing this kind of stuff. And it's always very humbling for me um, because I was just trying to do the right thing at the right time. And, and, you know, you don't know at the time that these things are going to be what they are. And, you know, so it, all I was hoping at the right time was that I could get a vibra slap on every album. And, you know, and then the little, you know, the little bits and pieces that I put in, if one person comes up to me and goes, oh, dude, that thing on Black Tiger where you do this, you know, that that's enough for me, you know, that, that at least somebody heard it. Somebody out there finally heard it, you know, <laughs> that I tucked in there a little Easter egg, you know, whatever. But, uh, you know, to me, it's, uh, it, it's very humbling that, you know, uh, and I'm very lucky that I was there at the right time. And I got to work with lots and lots of great people. And, you know, um, there's lots and lots of stories. So uh, by all means, call me back and we'll go through some more of them, you know. My favorite, part about, my, my favorite part about this interview is the way he does Ozzy. <laughs> his, his impersonation <laughs> of Ozzy. <laughs> Your impersonation of Ozzy is, is probably well, my favorite part of this whole... Always like shapes twats. <laughs> That's what he used to say. <laughs> oh, it's like fucking shapes twats. <laughs> yeah. Very funny. He's a funny guy, you know. He is. He is very, he is. very funny guy. All right, Max. All right, Max. It's Thank such a pleasure. You. You know, and hopefully we'll uh, see you at the Metal Hall of Fame next year or we'll see you in person and uh, it'll be great. All yeah, right. that's right. Yeah, well, hopefully everything will get back to normal pretty soon. Now we got the. Uh, like I say, I got my second vaccination in a couple of days. So me and Alan yeah. are still waiting for our first. Good luck with that. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, we're we're shipping you the AstraZeneca one. I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the Johnson and Johnson. The, Johnson G&G. G&G. <laughs> the leftovers go to Canada. The leftovers. That's what we signed up for. Yeah. Yeah. All well. right. Thank you, everybody who well, tuned stay in. Stay well, and looking forward to our next chat. Right. Yeah. Next time, and you know we. I feel bad for these people. I ask these questions and nobody gets to ask a question. So we can do more questions next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do it. You know what? We needed to break the ice. We needed to get everybody familiar with you. And you know what? And, but there was a lot of like Megadeth, Loudness. There was a lot of other bands. I wanted to stay on topic. I wanted to keep it sort of Aussie because there's just so much there, right? So Yeah, well, there's, you know, and then there's uh, Armored Saint. Um, yes, and, Delirious Nomad. And, Coney Hatch, yeah. like we were discussing earlier. Coney Hatch. And and the studio. Um, yeah, I mean, um, and Megadeth. And, yeah. You know, uh, Lynch Mob, the other yeah. ones. Oh, you know, I spoke to the other day, John Oliver. I haven't spoken to him for a long oh, time. Oh, Sabotage. Yes, yeah, Sabotage, Sabotage too, right? Yeah. And, and, uh, Lizzie Borden. Lizzie Borden, yeah. Visual Lies. Yeah. yeah, recently. Yeah. Oh, my Fates God. Fate's Warning. Fate's Warning. Wow, it's nice like morning. A... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's still around. Back. I I could do a go. And of course, the list. um, and of course, Death Angel. Uh, that, yes, uh, love Death oh, Angel. I just uh, just mixed a, an EP for those guys. Uh, Grim because... Reaper, Grim Reaper, Steve Grimmett. Right? Uh, Grim Reaper, yeah, with uh, Nick Boca. He's uh, still oh. an old friend of mine. He's working out at Sweetwater now. But... Yeah, you go. We got a yeah. lot of stories coming up, and Vendetta. I hear some stories about Vendetta. Vendetta, holy shit, yeah. 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 <laughs> Neil Turbin asked me to ask you about Vendetta and how they were playing, opening up for Van Halen, but they were playing with Eruption before Van Halen went on stage. That's like some bizarre thing. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, uh, Nicky Buzz, yeah, yeah. He's still around, actually. I think he's in Chicago now playing blues or something. But uh, yeah, we'll yeah that, that was the first uh, the first album that I did over in America after the, the Aussie stuff. And uh, for Epic Records, and uh, yeah, or, um, I did it at the uh, record plant in uh, the old record plant in uh, right. on uh, uh, wherever the hell it was La Cienega. 
<laughs> La Cienega, before it moved to Third Street. And then wow. uh, I remember that was amazing because uh, there were four rooms and we were in one room and Boston was in B and Fleetwood Mac were in D. <laughs> and oh Kesper, man, we got another show right here. We got another show Kesper right was here. C, and they had this amazing restaurant next door, the Entourage, where everybody would go over at five o'clock, would, would just go over from Never the street. Gonna end. That's crazy, crazy So the scene stories. in this is unbelievable, you know. Amazing. Wow, wow, wow. And you well, know, we can even throw in Lita Ford <laughs> on part three. Yeah. Say, this is my new album. All right, everybody, thank you for tuning Great in. Great time. Thanks, Max, again. Thank you, Max. Yeah, yeah, well. yeah, thanks very much for uh, inviting me.